All right. So we've got a lot of comments on courage, adaptability, the ability to pivot, the ability to look ahead and see what needs to be changed, grit, understanding how to come back from setbacks and navigate challenges, um, bouncing back from failure. There's a lot kind of in that same, in that same thing. So Janet, what do you say? Adaptive? Adaptive, way, ability to pivot, 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 grit, perseverance. Those are some of, I think, some yeah. of the key things. Good. Thank you for that. When, when you have 565 people chatting in, Janet, uh, I have to tell you, must have been speed reading that pretty fast over there. Okay. And uh, great. Thank you for that, big, Janet. I think, Ranji, the other theme is, is the ability to look forward and make appropriate changes. I said, so there's uh, been a couple of comments on that one too. Okay. Good. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Ability to adapt to adversity is the common, you commonly used definition in common parlance. And I also use this for the, even when I wrote that article, that's what I was, you know, but I, I had a nagging problem with this, especially the findings of that study that I was just telling you about, because I found this to be a very defensive response. It was like, how am I going to cope with adversity, right? We, we think of resilience as like, you know, I have setbacks, I have things happen to me and I got to find a way to cope with it. And how am I going to cope with that adversity? That becomes the kind of the, the operative theme in some ways. I think there's a part that is missing here, which is and how am I going to come out of it stronger? And, and, and I've had a chance, you know, over the years to interact with a number of leaders who've dealt with tremendous personal tragedy also. And I found it remarkable. They talk about not only how they coped with those situations, but how they came out of it stronger, how they came out of it better, how they use those setbacks to look forward in a way that, what are we gonna do differently, right? Uh, I love Charles's comment here, post-traumatic growth versus post-traumatic, uh, you know? And, and so, you know, that, I think that's exactly, that's very well said over here, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to think about. And, and I think is, uh, and I think you're absolutely right, the bounce, the bounce back idea uh, which Adam Grant and Sheryl Sandberg talk about as well, what, the whole idea of bouncing back. So absolutely right, right? And here's what I found. The la look at the last bullet here in this slide. I found that 9% of companies, I shouldn't say I, we, all three of us together worked on this together. We found that 9% of companies came out of recession stronger than when they went in. Somehow they came out stronger in terms of sales, profit, growth trajectory, everything. So my question to you is, what do you think these 9% of companies are doing differently? Better in terms of performance, I should clarify to you, Simon, in terms of sales, profit, and growth trajectory on all of the financial metrics, if you will. Now, I can't speak to public or private companies. That's unfortunately data not available. I had to limit myself to data that was available to me. This is a large sample study with 4,700 companies. I have anecdotal evidence. So what do you think these companies are doing differently? And Janet, it would be great if you can help me in this too. So a lot of comments on people engagement, having a long-term strategy plan, quick reactions, assessing what needs to be done and then reacting quickly. A lot on people, cost cutting, disruption, finding new business opportunities, understanding your customers better, innovation, pivot, new so vision, my question, and creativity. So Janet, my question to you and to everybody else is what are the 91% doing? 91%, I mean, that's like the majority of come. What are the other 91% doing? Someone said they give up, wow. sit on the sideline. They're panicking. Isn't that kind of scary that, you know, living in fear. So I, my punchline of this, and this is not even mine, Winston Churchill said this long time ago, right? Never waste a good crisis. It may seem overwhelming. It may seem, oh my God, how are we gonna get out of this? Let's, this too shall pass. How am I gonna survive? And we're building kind of coping systems. 
but how are we going to, I, this was the original title I had proposed to HBR. Unfortunately, they didn't take it, but you know, that was what we, all of us wanted to say. And when we were looking at the data, we looked at it very carefully to see it was remarkable how the, and now, unfortunately it wasn't the same 9% across those three recessions either. So there was learning that was lost. There's one company, some companies would do it in one, but not in the subsequent recessions. So this is the kind of the, the conversation I wanted to kind of explore with you, because what happens is crisis illuminate opportunities. And it also gives you a chance to reset things in your organization because people suspend are willing to change in crisis more than they are when things are going well, all kinds of resistance kicks in. I recently interviewed Kevin Johnson, the CEO of Starbucks for a series I'm doing right now. And uh, Kevin said, if we don't come out of this change, we missed an opportunity. And I didn't prime him. I didn't prime him. I said, what are you doing and how are you guys dealing with it? I mean, think about it. They, had, they were not doing drive-throughs because they're so focused on delivering the customer experience in the store. And now people want drive-through. It's like curbside pickup for groceries. So there are so many kind of patterns that people didn't see or didn't imagine would work or somehow it weren't connected to what they thought they were doing. So here's my next question for you. When we face adversity or adverse markets, who do we typically blame? So when growth stalls in a company, who do we blame? Do we blame the market or do we blame ourselves? Where do you think the real obstacle lies? So I shouldn't say who we blame, but where do you think the real obstacle lies? So let me just ask you that. Where, which is the biggest bottleneck for these 91%? So look at that. We blame the market. We blame markets, but the devil is inside. We are our own worst enemies. And that's what we learned in trying to unpack these 9% versus the 91%. Now, let me just dig into this a little bit more with you. So devil is not the customer saying, oh my God, they're price, price sensitive, they're demanding. It's us. And here's the thing, adversity like we're in now reveals and accelerates hidden weaknesses in incumbent firms. So we think we're going great. When we went in there, we just survive, come out, we'll come out on the other side, we'll be back to normal again. Things will be back to the way they were. So we're gonna go back to doing things exactly where we were doing before. It's just a question of surviving this recession. And unfortunately, it reveals hidden weaknesses. I'll give you, you know, even Jeff Bezos said this just about a year and a half ago. He said, one day Amazon will fail. Now, admittedly, he was getting divorced, so I don't know if that had a kind of colored his point of view at that time and the share voting and who's going to vote for his shares. But, you know, now I want to give you an example just to kind of illustrate this. to you. We all love Amazon these days, by the way. It's like the favorite case to talk about. You know, all of us have our favorites and Amazon is like the favorite. Everybody wants to learn about Amazon. What is Amazon doing? How are they doing it differently? What's going on with Amazon? much greater than Amazon was Sears, Roebuck and company. And I think it's worth noting what Sears did. Sears invented big box retail, first of all. When America started buying cars, Sears was right there with auto repair shops to sell us tires and batteries. When America started buying appliances, Sears launched private label and started selling us washing machines, dishwashers, refrigerators, microwaves, you name it, right? They were right there. You know, Peter Drucker, famous guru, said best managed company there is. They had a building named after them. They invented mail order also, by the way, catalogs, right? They, they cross-sold into having credit cards. Sales card was dominant, right? They didn't take MasterCard, Visa, or American Express in Sears stores, right? Sears owned Allstate Insurance. They owned Coldwell Banker. They owned Dean Witter. We could do our financial management there. We could buy our insurance there. We could do everything with them. We could buy our home there. Now look at what happens. Then. Start to see the pathology that kicks in. All we need to do is what we do a little better. Or well, here's another one. We've only been taught how to grow, not how to change. And you can see what happens over here. 1970s, when the decline had already begun, there was a recession right? 
rising inflation and economic slowdown, low cost nimble competitors, Walmart, JCPenney coming in. And they had bought, you know, all state insurance, which is draining their company profit. That was a really bad acquisition for them. And yet you look at the, what does the CEO says? It's the recession guys, it's not us. The slowdown isn't us, it's the recession. And you know, and they open their new headquarters. So big fanfare, big building, right? And then you have another CEO coming in a few years later and the decline is continuing. And so what does he do? He says, let's go bulk up on something else. Let's just get, you know, find we have cash. Let's go bulk up and buy a bunch of stuff. They bought real estate, which made actually no sense to buy a cold banker. And you can see what starts to happen. So, you know, you see these companies and the question you ask, I ask myself, what were the conversations do you think Wood and Telling held with their management teams? What were they talking about? What do you think, guys? What do you think was the, the, the conversation these leaders were having with their teams? What were they talk, discussing? I'm just curious if you, we were a fly on the wall in, the, in a conference room where they're talking about okay, Christmas party, I agree it's hindsight 2020, but it's the market, not the us. Market. What do you think? Janet, what's coming through to you? Internal figure pointing, we got to cut costs, who's responsible, blaming externalities, defending their position. So we start to see what starts to happen to companies. And what are the conversations they're not having or they should have been having? What are the opportunities? Where are the areas to innovate? How should we be changing? What is the competition doing that we're not? What are new areas of opportunity that we're not seeing? Introspection. What should we stop doing? Great, great observation. And you can see what starts to happen. This is a classic pathology, starts with denial. Denial is an amazing kind of human instinct, right? We don't want to see what we don't want to see. We get unfocused, there's so much going on. So I'm like firefighting, we call it the firefighting syndrome. Then I have overconfidence and customer loyalty. Where are they going to go? They've been with us forever. Do they know who we are? And we kind of lose touch with our customer. They're drifting away from us and we're not catching it. And then finally, when we wake up, we don't know how to change. And you can see Blackberry. I can give you many other examples. You can see Motorola, so many iconic, Nokia. I can give you example after example of iconic companies that have gone through the same thing. 